Hey, what's up, David? <laughs> Thank you. I, I man, my mic is so tricky. Sometimes I think because I mute it uh, during the uh, during the intro, uh, but then I will unmute. I th or I think I unmute, and then it doesn't work. So hopefully you can hear me, David. Let me know. I, it should be unmuted now. My microphone can be a little sticky. It is a very old Blue Yeti, and it really needs to be replaced. But I haven't had the wherewithal to do that yet. So, uh, welcome everybody. It is Sunday night. Uh, we are doing some world building streaming. Uh, thanks for your patience with my silly tech. Uh, but we have an extra special treat tonight because tonight we are looking at the map of Kum, the, uh, the Dwarven Kingdom that is the, uh, the setting for my campaign. I have spent, uh, oh, you have a Blue Yeti, you have the same problem. Yeah, I, I, I push this button and it just, it, it just loves to be muted and it does not like to unmute. Um, yeah, so in case you have never tuned in before, I am working on a campaign that, boys, howdy, someday I would sure love to run. Um, I was planning on running it, you know, in like 2020, and uh, that didn't happen. And then I was like, I'll run it in 2021. Didn't happen either. Uh, and so maybe 2022, uh, once the, uh, the pandemic tamps itself back down. But it is a dwarven-themed campaign. It is set in a fallen kingdom inspired by places like Moria and Erebor in The Lord of the Rings. And it is called Coom. And uh, yeah, it is this vast, frozen, uh, mountainous uh, little corner of my setting. And uh, for the past couple of months, I've mentioned this, that my... Um, my players in my home game, which is set in the same world, but at a vastly different time period, like uh, maybe 1,500 years or so before the events of the campaign, um, have come to Coombe uh, to uh, uh, take a contract there as a mercenary army. And so I was sort of obliged then to map the whole thing, even though they're only going to be, you know, running around a tiny corner of it. I thought, you know, this is a good opportunity to actually map the thing. So this map that we're looking at right here is Coombe in year 68 of the Second Age, which is, as I said, is about 1,500 years before the actual campaign Helm and Crown, the one I intend to podcast, uh, will, be, uh, will be set. But because of the nature of the kingdom and the nature of the dwarven people, uh, they are extremely kind of set in their ways, and they have a tendency to just sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, keep things as static as possible. The kingdom hasn't changed all that much in that time. It definitely has changed, and there are some big major changes which we'll talk about. But I thought this would be a great opportunity to um, do some geography and some like literal world building on stream. I have here a big document of all of the different interesting locations and landmarks and things 
that we have previously built on previous streams. And uh, it seems nice on this first page, but the deeper you get, the little, the more spotty it becomes and the more like, uh, kind of like blank, blank, blanks we have. So I would love to ooh, even have some, uh, some spoilerific stuff that I can't talk about. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to go through uh, the locations I have here on this list. I'm going to point them out here on the map. That way we can talk about them and then try to brainstorm. I like to have, in addition to like a summary, I like to have three kind of like interesting sort of like fun facts about the location. Those could be characters associated with the location. Those could be um, unusual terrain effects or they could even be adventure hooks, right? Things that the players might interact with. Anything that could affect a description or could affect an encounter or could affect an adventure that might be set uh, near that particular location. But like I said, this map is of Coombe from a different time period, so it very well might be different. Uh, there might be things that have changed, uh, so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna maybe do like a quick walkthrough. I think I have my stream here configured so that way I can zoom in to particular areas um, to show you a little bit more of the map. Uh, it very well might um, lag a little bit when I do that, so I'm going to try to keep the, uh, the, the scrolling and the talking either separated or to a minimum. Um, but yeah, we're just gonna, we're gonna buzz through. This is also gonna be a little bit of cleanup for me because this document that I have has a lot of really kind of scattered notes that are not especially well, uh, uh, not especially well uh, kept. So um, I'm just gonna go basically to my nearest blanks and then try to fill it out from there. So I've organized the notes into different categories. We have bodies of water, we have um, caves and caverns, which we'll mostly ignore today because that's all gonna be kind of like underground. Um, we have dungeons, which we might talk a little bit about. Um, we have Dwarven Holds. This one could use definitely use some work. Uh, I know there's some gaps here. Um, forests and Plains needs a lot of work. Uh, monuments and Wonders could use some work too. Lots of uh, bracketed things there. Uh, mountains and Mountain Ranges. We have a whole bunch of these. Um, and I've done some work, but not all of them. Uh, towns and Cities could use a little bit of love. Vales and Valleys as well. So those are all of our categories. Um, if you have, as we're talking, any ideas for other cool locations in, that you want to throw out there, please do. This map is by no means, here, I should zoom back out. This map is by no means comprehensive. There are certainly lots of other locations that could be in Coombe, particularly underground locations that don't necessarily feature here. Coombe is one of the few places in my world that you could charitably describe as having an underdark. Uh, there are lots of tunnels and caverns and passages that have been kind of, uh, uh, dug and excavated all through the kingdom. So uh, subterranean locations is something that we are kind of uh, lacking, definitely. Um, so I think for the most part, our bodies of water are all good, at least the ones we have here. I might um, look at the map and see if there's anything that we added. So uh, the gigantic ocean we have kind of up here in the north, in the, north, uh, the northwest, um, which is uh, called that not because of its... Uh, not because it's huge, it is huge, but it is mainly because it is home to the frost giants that kind of ply the frozen waters. Um, Vinderheim is not on this map, but it's kind of where the frost giants come from. Dragon's Grave Pool is on this map, but uh, it's not known as that at this time. If we zoom all the way in, we can kind of see Stone Sister right here. This fortress is surrounded by a moat, uh, and that moat eventually becomes Dragon's Grave Pool once uh, uh, Vescathor the uh the dragon falls into it and freezes the uh the pool uh the Ezcon is not uh on this map but um it is sort of on this map because it is beneath this salt pan called the red thirst which you can see over here the Ezcon is a large subterranean lake basically like a little subterranean sea i um, mean beneath the salt uh, uh flats that's where you find that sea um, the Desperation Sound uh, we have right here, um, very well located. Um, the Many Load is a river, a river basin, uh, which is located over here, kind of to the north by Port Sumpton. Um, it's where this river called the Compromise empties out uh, into many different little rivers and where the town of Port Sumpton has been constructed. Uh, Kudranone is an interesting river. It's called the Mother's Milk. 
and it sort of winds its way through the kingdom. It starts way over here um, in a mountain called the Nursemaid. Let me zoom in and go over there. You can kind of see it. Called the Nursemaid here. And then it moves through this area called the Gorge Lands. And then it goes underground for a bit. You can kind of see it here, the Kudronone. The idea is that the Kudronone is like this drinkable, fertile uh, water that never freezes over the course of the year, even in the, the, the depths of winter. Um, it kind of flows its way through. It comes down here into Vamrathul, or the Valley of Plenty, um, and then disappears again underground, and then comes back here uh, from Threshold and through Kagat's window all the way across. I know I said I was going to keep scrolling and talking to a minimum, and then what do I do? I follow the entire river. Um, before it eventually empties out into this area called the Milk Bowl, because it's Kudranon means mother's milk. Obviously, that's where it gets its name. And then it empties into the sea. Um, it passes through many different dwarven holds, and, and its tributaries run all throughout uh, the kingdom underneath the, uh, underneath the water. Um, we have Lake Reflection, or Reflection Lake, which we're going to change that. Um, it's an artificial lake that was created by a dam. Um, the dam doesn't translate super well to the map, but this thing here called the Mother's Embrace is a dam that's made from a pair of stone arms that look like it's kind of holding the water back. Uh, and the conceit here with the dam is that it was, uh, with the lake, is that it was made purely to be a reflecting pool for these massive statues here in the range of sovereigns. So you can see some of the grandest statues uh, better reflected in this perfectly still lake. Um, we have Sulphur Springs as well. Uh, that, those are the kind of rivers that flow down from Krasvedon, this great dormant volcano in the center of, uh, of Kum. Krasvedon um, is uh, probably the largest mountain in the world, and it's uh, uh, currently dormant at the time of the campaign I'm running, but it has recently exploded in uh, Helm and Crown. So uh, the, a lot of the, the terrain around Krasvedon will be different based on the, you know, the explosion. Um, let's see, let's see. Oh, Sulphur Springs could use a little bit of love, actually. Let's talk about it. So here's what we have written. We have a series of streams, tributaries, and waterfalls that trickle down Krasvedon slopes. Sulphur Springs is one less waterway is, is less one waterway and more a flowing countryside of geothermally heated water. Um, I have one little description here. I want to come up with two more. Many small pools dot the slopes of the volcano, providing ideal meeting places for dwarves from every clan. The idea with Krasvedon as a mountain is that it is kind of like a neutral meeting place for uh, dwarves from all over Coom. So that definitely is keeping in line with Sulphur Springs. Uh, the characters in my home game in the Menagerie have actually been to Sulphur Springs, so I do know a few more things about it. Uh, in addition to the hot springs, oh boy, the typing is coming in really slowly. Sorry about that. In addition to the hot springs, um, Sulphur Springs, oops, Sulphur Springs has a large number of tables and lounges, and meeting places, or and verandas, tables and verandas and vistas built into the slopes. Verandas and vistas constructed into the mountain slopes. I kind of compared it to like a college campus, right, with a lot of like seating areas and like, like verandas and like uh, uh, kind of dining sections. It's like there's no kitchen or anything to provide for it, but it's like almost like this terraced park uh, the Dwarven equivalent of a terraced park. Equivalent of a terraced park surrounds the volcano. Um, in addition to that, uh, an ancient, the ancient, let's see, ancient statuary, statuary, believed to be petrified fire giants encircle the mountain as well encircle the mountain as well they were let's see like uh dwarven legend contends that they were instantly petrified by ignone the Dwarven Goddess of Earth. The Dwarven Goddess of Earth. When the clans united against 
their common foe. So there's a fable that is, I would say, true. This is the weird thing about, about Dungeons and Dragons worlds is that, like, legends and systems like this are, and worlds like this are almost always just true facts. Um, but the, uh, the legend says that, um, that, uh, the dwarves basically had an ancient war way back in the, you know, sort of pre-recorded history where they were warring over a particular, particular gem, the gem that would become the, uh, the Dubadas or the Arkenstone of my campaign. And they were all scattered and warring against each other and, uh, they were arguing about it, and that that's where Kozodon came from. It was it was in the myth. It's a volcano that suddenly burst from the ground, um, and it drove the clans apart. And not only did the did the volcano explode, but then coming out of the volcano came an army of fire giants, and they occupied the uh, the mountain, and they began to build weapons, and they were going to try to conquer Kum. Right. Each one of the seven elder clans threw themselves against the fire giants, but they couldn't defeat them, and only when the dwarves came together. Could, did they have the force to march back on the mountain? But when they got to the mountain, they discovered that all of the fire giants had been petrified and turned to stone. And it's largely believed that the fire giants were themselves a test by the earth goddess to see if the dwarves could work together. If they could, then there was no more need for them, and so she instantly petrified them, but kept them there as a reminder of what happens when the dwarves bicker and fight. So there's this cultural idea among the dwarves that... Uh, that that in like actual open warfare amongst each other is to be frowned upon. Uh, great. Okay, we're gonna skip over caves and caverns for now because I don't think that that's especially relevant to what we're talking about topographical maps. Um, let's see. Let's go through these stone sister. We have we talked about that. It's a big fortress. Um, we have the Durlock door, which um, I think is right over here. Uh, it is a sealed door that leads into the. Um, yeah, it means great locked door in Dwarven. Houses an immense library in a vast hall stacked with tomes. Each verse of the prayer to Umbor is carved upon the walls and pillars. Tens of thousands of verses. Um, so we have this one. Yep, the door is protected by a password known only to uh, Queen Kavmari, and this would be the Poet Errant, not the Poet Laureate. Um, the Poet Errant is a kind of a wandering figure who writes uh, each verse of the, uh, the prayer to Umbor, kind of like the history of the dwarves. More than merely a library, uh, it is also their archive and personal workshop where uh, most of their composition is done. Sure, for the poet Aaron. Enchanted lanterns hover around anyone who passes through the door. That's cool. A secret the party desperately needs, the clue about the location of the secret vault, is carved in the last verse of the prayer to Umbor. The poet Aaron died here, composing and carving the final verse. That's a cool one. Um, great. So next we have the Halls of Rest, or the Hall Raisi. Which, I, ooh, I actually don't think that's on this map. It, it is located, like, right here at the slopes of Zamadon. I should have put it down. That's so silly of me. I'll have to add that next time. But the idea is, is that um, there uh, is a... Oh, maybe that's what it was. I think I wanted to change the name of this. That it's called, like, the, the Door of Rest. But the notion is that Zamadon is uh, called the Secret Mountain. And it is the first uh, place where the dwarves supposedly came from. Umbor, the god of creation, supposedly awoke uh, beneath Zamadan and walked out uh, into Kum, this thing that uh, uh, his his wife Ignon had made. And he kind of wandered it sort of uh, uh, um, Durin style and named all the mountains and stuff. Um, but that's also where the, um, the uh, dwarves believe that um, basically Valhalla, Jean Dor, oh yeah, the secret door, that's what it is. Um, where basically where all the dwarves are interred is here in this mountain. And the notion is that like you go and you take the dwarves there and then when they die, um, their spirits can, uh, uh, once, once they're interred, their spirits can wander through the halls of the Zamadan and eventually find their way to the secret door that leads into the dwarven afterlife. The dwarves believe that the earth, that like, that, that heaven, quote unquote, is actually here on earth. It's just hidden and no one can find it. Um, so, uh, the doorway, the halls of rest basically are the kind of like necropolis where the dwarves are entombed. Um, so what do we have here? We have, on the slopes of the Zamadan, approached by a winding stair is a simple stone doorway. This doorway leads to the halls of rest, or the hall Razi, where the bodies of the ancient dwarven dead are interred. None actually know what lies behind that door. No dwarf would dare enter, and none others, and no others are permitted. Only the ghoul Yavari, the corpse collectors, have ever ventured within, and they will not speak of what they've seen. 
The Barrow of Seven Judges is believed to be located somewhere inside the Halls of Rest. They are observed to emerge from the doorway. Uh, so two things. The Gulyavari, the Corpse Collectors, are like uh, clay constructs that go and collect the dead and then bring them back. Um, and then the Barrow of Seven Judges, the judges are the kind of judicial system of Coombe. They are these like uh, sort of spectral, spiritual judges believed to be the spirits of seven previous dwarven thanes that swore to uphold the laws the, the words in stone and now are kind of like animating their armor um so we have to come up with something else about the Gulyavari. we've talked about them a little bit um in previous streams but some other interesting thing about the halls of rest uh so like there's a line about how and no others are permitted. Like, what is it that keeps you out of the Halls of Rest? Like, I like the idea that there's no door or guard. It's just like an opening. It's a doorway. Or that no dwarf would willingly go in. But what happens when you go in? Is it just that no one who's ever gone in has ever returned? Maybe it's that. Yeah, I mean, that's a little bit, you know, woo, but I kind of like that. Nothing protects the doorway. Nothing protects the doorway into the halls of rest anyone can simply walk inside for all that though its contents still remain a secret for any living being that crosses that threshold never returns yeah, I mean, I think that's simple enough, right? Like, the, the cool note about it is that it's not guarded. It's just anyone can walk in. Uh, we're going to skip over this blackened bit because that is uh, uh, confidential information for people who want to listen to the podcast. Um, we have high anchorage. That is the... Um, oh, right. We wanted to change this. This shouldn't be called high anchorage anymore. This should be called uh, Tower of Zundakun. Tower of Zundakun. This is the upside-down tower of this uh this famous wizard named Zundakun. So it's a uh, Zundakun. So the roof beams are unusual because these mountains have um uh their peaks kind of like hover up above the rest of the mountain, right? So they kind of float above it. There's a, a substance inside them called wing rock that causes these peaks to float. Um and the tower of Zundakun is a wizard's tower constructed by like the sort of the Merlin, if you will, of Kum. Um, that is upside down hanging from the peak, right? Uh, no one really knows how he built it or what, what's going on there. Um, the wound, uh, interesting. That should actually probably be... Oh, it's listed under dungeons, sure. The wound is a location way over here. It's not on this map because it's A, underground, and B, hasn't been made yet. But the idea is that uh, centered on Splitstone, this Dwarven Hold right here in the center, it's a tiny rift in Ondun's sacristial mantle. So the world has a, a mantle around its core made of a, a metal called sacristial that basically contains a uh, yog inside of it. And so there was eventually a breach, a tiny little like like crack in the sac sacristial that then allowed yog to escape. <laughs> Let's do this gesture a lot. That allowed yog to escape to that hole and cause this whole big thing. But that's underground. We have three facts about it. We don't need to go into it. Um, okay, so into dwarven holds. Here's where we kind of get a lot of things that we could maybe uh, we could maybe use to flesh out. So we have an arit or an aret. I never know how this is pronounced, but it's a it's a really interesting um, uh, geographical feature that I've always wanted to. Uh, to include in Coombe somewhere, but I don't really have a good idea for it. So it's kind of like a ridge line, I think. Let's see if I can actually pull up a picture without it like completely destroying uh, the uh, the stream. A ret. Is that what we can? I can show you. It's not an earring in Spanish. Maybe that's the word in Spanish. But yeah, it's like a ridge line like this, right? So the idea of like a dwarven hold built along there, you know. I think could be kind of cool where it's like sloped on either side. I don't know if you can even see that or if that if that translated at all. Uh, there's a there's an inter there's a picture on Pinterest that has that exact image, but I'm not going to try to load Pinterest right now because I feel like that will kill the stream. So I, I like the idea of a dwarven hold that's built along there, but I feel like without the clan, we don't really know what the deal is. So maybe we'll come back to that. Um, Trying to figure out where it could be. We have a lot of openings here in the uh, in the glittering hills. 
Um, I like the joke of the glittering hills, these ones over here, that anyone else would look at these places and they would be like, oh man, these are mountains. But the, the dwarves are like, oh, those are just hills. You know, maybe it's like right along here could be kind of cool. So I'll put a note, perhaps constructed in the glittering hills. Cool, I love it. Um, the Brewer Clan. Uh, so their hold... Boy, did I do this one already? I don't remember. I don't remember. I might have to pull up another document. We have Cold Store over here. It could be that one. I know that's one of the... There are three, like, Brewer Clans in, um... In, uh, in Coombe. I don't know if Cold Store is the one. But we have known for their incredibly strong brew. So strong it was essentially poison to non-dwarves. The clan is called Clan Rotgut. I don't think that's Cold Store. I think that they might be somewhere else. Are they to the south? Let me look. False Mine, Spears Take, Crag Home, Crown Stone, no. Um, yeah, I don't know. Shoot, I'm gonna have to look it up. Um, but we know that, like, uh, when they abandoned their hold during the Seven Sorrows, they opened their remaining Everfull Taps and utterly flooded the hold. I wanted the idea of, like, a hold that is, like, from top to bottom flooded with booze, right? It has sat undisturbed for 500 years, the alcohol sitting stagnant all that time. When open, it cascades down in a gushing torrent. Um, uh, so let's see. Yeah, then we talk about the idea of, like, what, what lives there, right? Like, far from, far from being abandoned... A number of strange creatures have adapted, have adapted to these flooded conditions. Like 500 years, right? Think about that. Flooded conditions. There are booze methods, booze elemental. There are booze elementals. Um, booze oozes, and one especially drunken. Odiug. Um, yeah, designed like a distillery, vats, hammers to crush hops. Um, the hold is designed is designed like a distillery. Great vats rest in the great hall. Um, animated hammers crush meant to crush hops. That could totally be like a trap though, right? Meant to crush hops. Um, an underground lake used as a storehouse. Is that what it said? Boy, now I forget. Boozes. Under, yeah, uh, boozes. I guess it would be boozes, yeah. But I'm not gonna remember, if, if I just say boozes, I'm not gonna remember what it is. So I gotta put booze oozes. I mean, yeah, my portmanteau like brain wants to do booze oozes. Um, shoot, now I forget how I had phrased that. Let's copy this and then go keep going back. What did I say about an underground lake? I don't remember. Yeah, a lake is a storehouse. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, we have Castle Cloud Peak. This is another one we can talk about. Oh, I want to figure out which which clan that was. Let me pull up another window really quick. Um, I want to check because I want to make sure this is right. This is what I mean about like a lot a lot of today's stream is just me doing housekeeping, right? Um, okay, give me just a second. It might get a little bit of laggy while I do this, so apologies. More than clans. Do do do. Ah, you know what? If it's going to take this long, it's already being slow. I could maybe look it up on my own time. Let me see. Um, rot gut. Oh, maybe I don't have. Maybe they haven't uh, come into existence at that time yet. Rot gut. Oh, nope, I got it. Come on. It's still loading. Give me a minute. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Oh my gosh. All 
sorry this is taking so long now i wish i hadn't done it but i've got it here and then I, we can make a note about where it can go potentially oh my gosh why is this being so slow this was a big mistake um Like, the Arete loaded way faster than this. There we go. Oh, pff, no, it's not even in here. Are you kidding me? That's so annoying. Okay. Ugh. Dumb. Well, I'll figure it out later. Okay. A castle cloud peak. A flying castle constructed on a nugget of wing rock. It's right over here. Uh, I, I wanted to put it somewhere where it wasn't, uh, like, it, it docks at high anchorage, but it kind of flies around the kingdom. I wanted to put it here. So that way, uh, to kind of show how far away it can go. Um, another wing rock abandoned all its traps armed, floating randomly around the kingdom. Could it crash? Could it be programmed to crash somewhere in particular? Does it have an anchor that drags across the land? Yeah. So all this we have. Um, ooh, we know one more thing about Castle Cloud Peak. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the dragons. So let's see. Let me break this down. Um, floating randomly across the kingdom. Uh, its anchor was dropped 500 years ago, years ago, and has carved a perfectly circular uh, canyon through the earth over those 500 years, 500 years. The chain finally broke, and now the anchor lies embedded in the i think they're called the clatter downs the mountains here to the north like yeah i think they're it's like somewhere up in here so um i have done a previous version of this map but the idea is that like kind of starting at the clatter downs coming all the way around smashing through van Rathul, and then like looping back kind of crossing with the uh kudranon and then circling back that like the castle is on this perpetual like tour of the kingdom and then it was dragging this anchor behind it the entire way and then eventually uh it got caught in the clatter downs um and the chain snapped and now the chain is still dangling but the uh uh the anchor is, is uh, no longer dragging that's one thing for sure um and then we have um the anchor was dropped 500 years ago we have one of the towers uh we'll say um well, what's his name now Batharax. Batharax, one of the two younger white dragons that plague Coom, has a hatred of the castle and attacks it on sight. Thus, one of the towers is coated with ice and occasionally used as a lair by the hungry worm right that it's like the notion that depending on when you're there you might encounter the dragon um despite the traps the castle is a picture of comfort and luxury it has a features include a statue garden features include a statue garden where all the statuary floats from wing rock and an arboretum arboretum re arboretum arboretum how do you spell that word an arboretum full of rare and exotic trees exotic flora from across the world the idea with the with the clan that lives there, Clan Cloud Peak, is they're all about like comfort and luxury, right? So the notion that they would have some of these things that would sort of be considered antithetical to like dwarven luxury, right? They'd have trees. The statue is obviously pretty normal, but they would have these like silks and they would have, you know, uh, perfumes and things like that. Like they're all about comfort and luxury. Um, and so I, 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 it actually came up in our, in our uh, home game. Uh, the characters went to a hold of an under clan who's loyal to to clan cloud peak um and they saw a camp for tree 
which is a, a big, massive kind of a southern hemisphere tree. It's actually the tree that Totoro lives in, in my neighbor Totoro. Um, and my justification for that was that it was a gift from uh, Clan Cloud Peak, which means that Castle Cloud Peak would have a whole like arboretum full of them. Uh, great, love that. Okay, that's Castle Cloud Peak. That's got three interesting things then. Cool. Uh, Timber Hall we have. Timber Hall is a wooden dwarven hall here, the home of uh, Clan Axebite. Um, the joke is that it constantly burns down. Um, Snow Perch is where actually our characters are right now in my home game. Um, it's uh, yeah constructed in the roof beams. It's got a big uh, 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 crossbow. That's all there. Uh, sunken seat we have definitely talked about at length, so I, I won't necessarily go too much into that. But we could we could fill it out. Um, the sunken seat is located way over here. And it's uh, built deeper than anything else in Coombe, a massive pillar that descends ever downward, a staircase. Oh, we gotta break this up. It's kind of, this, this is what I mean. It's a very, like, uh, messy. The seat of Clan Deep Vein. Deep Vein. Sunken seat is the deepest uh, point in all of Coombe. Constructed around, constructed around a massive pillar that descends ever downward. Staircases ring that pillar wide enough for ten dwarves to stand abreast. At each level bridges that can raise and lower lead to more warrens cargo elevators rise and fall on massive winches and chains um and then we'll, we'll do a the thane's seat is at the lowest point constructed atop a thin sheet is at the pillar's lowest point constructed atop a thin sheet of sacro steel it's so thin that yogg's essence can be seen swirling beneath it's cool um, let's see, let's see. Two more interesting things about it. Um, I think that that pillar is actually like a stalactite that goes all the way from the ceiling all the way down to the bottom, right? It's like one contiguous piece. Um, they've got the cargo elevators, sunken seat, sunken seat. Um, it's located kind of like right here, right? Um, let's see, let's see. I'm trying to think of other cool things about it. I don't know if this is really working, you guys. I might try to change up sort of how we're doing this. Maybe we put down, because I have a couple of them in here, like Fine Forge and Split Stone and Strong Arch that don't actually have good descriptions of them. Um, yeah, let's add any one that doesn't have a good description. So let's go like uh, Fine Forge. Put it after Castle Cloud Peak. Fine Forge. And that is Bl Clan Blade Forger, I believe. Yep. And then we have Split Stone. Do we have that one? No. We have these in alphabetical order, too. This is very messy. Uh, the Pillars is a little higher than that. That might actually be under uh, Monuments. Yeah, let's put that over here under Monuments. Do, do, do monuments the gorge we don't have yet horn hollow is an h horn hollow steam slope would go a little higher fascinating watching me organize all of this steam slope would be here yeah, let's maybe stop and build some of these before I get too much further into this organization. Okay, so, um, Fine Forge. 
uh, the home of of Clan Blade Forger. Fine Forge is known for its furnace. The only thing we know about Clan Blade Forger is that we had a, a PC uh, in one game come from that clan that they are basically like eradicated following the uh, the Seven Sorrows, and that they um, they make like magical weapons. That's kind of their thing. Um, so. Definitely, I like the idea that, like, obviously, it's called Fine Forge, so, you know, their their huge furnace is probably the thing that is most salient about them. But in terms of what they actually, like, do and, like, what's going on at their hold, I'm not really sure. Um, Fine Forge is known for, known for its furnace and for the magical, magical weapons that they produce. Um, hmm. Get some cool features about them. We've talked about like let's get to this point now where it's like you have to synthesize all these different ideas, right? Um there's like the Oriads. Mm. Mm. Yeah, my brain is not working right now. Maybe we it's been too long since we've done one of these streams, you know? Mm. I feel like without knowing the clan, it's hard to know like what's going on in these locations. Yeah. Shoot. I am not uh don't have the brain power to figure this out right now. I'm gonna see, I'm gonna pull up my document about them on my phone this time. So hopefully we can cross reference and see like what we need to know about uh, Blade Forger, if there's anything to say about Fine Forge. Um, Cause I know that they were eradicated. The idea was that they were like one of the first clans hit when the, the troglodytes sprung out of Splitstone that kind of went running north, going in all directions they could, right? They went running north and they, Sunken Seat like closed their doors they went north and they just despoiled Fine Forge. And they went down into the Ezcon and did all of that. So let me pull up um, my uh, my document here on my phone and see if I can read a little bit of information we have about them. Um, Dwarven clans. I should get off the Wi-Fi. That might make it easier. Okay. Um, Dwarven clans. Yeah, so it's like without knowing the clan, it's a little tricky to do some of these. We could do a horn hollow while I look for it, but like, oh my gosh, why is this taking so long? Dwarven. Plans. Okay. Dwarven clans. All right. Horn hollow we know pretty well. Which other ones do I need to, to develop? Steam slope needs some work. Um. Crownstone, I think we know pretty okay. Quick Lime needs some work. Copper Keel. Um, God, this is take everything is taking forever. It's very frustrating. So we know that we know they have a big furnace, right? Where they they do their forging. We know that a lot of magical weapons are made from um, oriads, which are kind of like a steel or or that has almost like a dryad like fey creature in it. Um, but beyond just like they have a furnace that makes cool weapons, I don't really understand what the what the neat thing is about it. Scrolling, 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 scrolling. Deep vein. Here we go. Um, Blade Forger. Um, the makers of fine magical weapons, Blade Forger, was extinguished by troglodytes during the Sorrows. The current bla clan, Blade Forger, is a fraud committed by imposters and permitted by Clan Deep Vein in exchange for their help. So there's no information about Fine Forge. <laughs> Great. Um, hmm. Maybe it's maybe the point. Okay, here we go. What if the forge itself is unique because it can transform ordinary ore into magical ore, ideal for the purposes of crafting magic weapons and armor? Crafting magical weapons and armor. Like my instinct is that so so Coom has like a, a a metal called adamant that is I mean a lot of settings do but my version of adamant is that it's like the only substance that can't be um, that can't be shaped like we've never found the technology or the material it's like harder than diamond 
right? And so you find like natural deposits of it and it's super, super rare and, and hard, but you can't really do anything with it because it's too hard, right? Uh, my instinct is then to say that, like the forge itself is made from adamant or something, but then why would they, like, how do they make it? You know what I mean? Purposes of crafting magical weapons and armor. Um, we can make the thing about how it was obliterated by the, uh, by the troglodytes. Um, when the sorrows, or when troglodytes spilled up from the wound, they, here, comfortable here, okay, they obliterated, oh, oh, I can't read it, obliterated several surrounding clans, including Blade Forger, Forger, Fine Forge is now a haunted troglodyte nest. Dite nest. And the Forge, Ashen Cold. So like my instinct was first to say that the troglodytes like use the Forge, but I think like leaving it there and saying that like it's just this powerful thing that they can't get their hands on, right? Um. Hmm. I want one more like interesting like uh uh thing about the forge or like a, a, a more geographical note, right? Like how is arch architectural? Like how is it designed? What does it look like? What's its deal? Um. If it's if it's basically a big furnace, do they have some means to keep it cool? Do they? you know, have some means to vent out the smoke? Is there something, like, unique or ingenious about that in some way? Um, mm, I, I like the idea of evolving adamant in some capacity. There's something about the forge where it's, like, made from adamant, or... I mean, maybe it's not a furnace. Maybe it has, they have some other means of making these magic items that, like, they make weapons, and then they can do something that uh, enchants them. I, I kind of like that idea that it's like there's an uh, like there's an adamant I'm thinking about like the sword and the stone right where like boy where like is the conceit that you make a weapon and then y you go to the there's like a big pillar of adamant or whatever, and they have to like thrust the sword into the adamant or something, and then that in some way makes it magical, or you know what I mean? That there's like something a little bit more unique about the stone itself. Ooh, adamant anvils? That's cool, David. I like that idea. Yeah, they that's it. There you go. The anvils in the forge are all made from adamant. Ooh, they ring quieter, yeah. The anvils in the forge are all made from adamant like raw deposits specifically placed here specifically placed so like the anvils themselves don't look like anvils but they're just kind of like these rough uh things and they've maybe been flattened over years and years that's the only time anyone's ever shaped anything it's like to show how long it's taken you to beat it yep that's great um raw deposits specifically placed to serve as anvils as anvils they ring quieter, and what's more, the years and years of manufacture have beaten the adamant, beaten the anvils into shape, beaten the, the anvils smooth, showing that indeed enough effort can shape adamant. Like that's the only ever that's the only thing that ever has. Cool. Thank you, David. I think I was getting a little stuck there. I appreciate your help with that one. Uh great. Horn Hollow is a simple one. Um located at the southernmost tip tip of Coom. Horn Hollow is not on this map because it wasn't made yet, but it is this mountain. You see like way down here at the southernmost tip. 
That is Horn Hollow. The southernmost tip of Coombe, Horn Hollow is a hollow mountain. Or Horn Hollow is the seat of Clan Hornwinder. Is the seat of Clan Hornwinder. And is the functional home base. Home base of the party. Of Harada Hornwinder and her of Harada Hornwinder and her claim to the throne. And her clan's claim to the throne. Her clan's claim to the throne. A hollow mountain. It gets its name, its name, it gets, it earns its name, it earns its name from the Umbraca horn. Umbraca horn constructed into its summit that one blow on the horn, one blow on the horn can be heard by every dwarf in the world. Um, I'm gonna say uh, during the battle of three blasts, the horn was used to scatter and demoralize a dwarven army attempting to besiege the keep or the hold. Um, during the retreat, uh, what, what was their name? I forget the name of the Thane now. Um, the previous Thane of Clan Hornwinder blew the horn three times, blew the horn three times, signaling a retreat. And this is marked as the end of Coombe's Golden Age. Coombe's Golden Age. Great. Uh, Timber Hall we have. Snow Perch we have. Steam Slope. Okay, great. Let's go back up to Steam Slope. So Steam Slope is a small little one right here on the far edge, not that far from Fine Forge. Um, and it, what do we have here? It is a large central bath. A spring has... Healing properties, extra hit dice. So it's basically like a hot spring clan. Um, it they are loyal to Mist. Uh, sorry, they are loyal to uh, Iron Spring, who is located here in Mistmont. And uh, let me look up the um, what we know about them, if we know anything. Actually, we might not because Iron Spring is not one we've done on the stream yet for secret reasons. Um. <laughs> That's not right. We don't have uh, anything about them. So I don't think I have anything on my clans about Iron Spring. Golden Plate. Okay, so yeah, we have this whole thing to do then. So we know that they are uh, magical, like, um, magical, like, healing baths, like healing springs, right? Um, we also have Ruby Reach to do. Oh, Timber Hall would go after Snow Perch. What am I thinking? Timber Hall. After all of these. Okay. Um. So we have Steam Slope. We don't even have a name for the clan yet. That's a tricky one because you can't do Iron Spring because we have Mistmont already. Ooh, I might come back to this one. This is a tricky one. I also know that we have um, Ruby Reach here. We can do Ruby Reach. That one, I know the name of the clan and kind of what they do. Uh, that's Brine Miner. Um, and we also have Strong Arch. Needs to go in here. Go after Steam Slope. Strong Arch. And that is clan... Oh boy, what is that one? I know they make like mining tunnels. Like that's kind of their thing. Uh, let me check. <laughs> this is fascinating, I'm sure. Deep Vein, they're an underclan of Deep Vein. Broadbeam, that's their name. 
broad beam. Yeah, I'm gonna add all the ones we don't have yet. That way we know exactly what we need to work on. So, um, strong arch we don't have. Split stone I don't think we have either. Split stone. Well, we kind of do because that's the wound. But let's put split stone on here for the sake of argument. Split. Well, if, if for this one, no, we don't need to put it because we have it as the wound, so that's fine. Um, glass garden. We need glass garden, and that's by gem blower, I think. Glass garden, gem blower. Boy, I forget. Is that what it is? Or is it gem grower? It might be gem grower. Time to check. They are loyal to clan bright shard i believe in their clans um rolling glass grower yep glass grower because they kind of like glow crystals so not gem glower but glass grower glass grower um looking around for other dwarven holds oh do we not we don't have wonder works be way down here let's go wonder works Wonder works. That is Iron Wonder. They're kind of like artificers. Um, Stone Street would be, I guess technically Stone Street counts. Yeah, let's put Stone Street on here. Although I, I do think I know stuff about that one. Stone Street. That's a uh, Clan Bright Shard. Bright Shard. Um, Cold Store. After Castle Cloud Peak, Cold Store. That is Pure Brew. It's one of the Brewer clans. Um, we have Timber Hall, we have Snow Perch, High Anchorage, the Columns, Shine Heart, we don't have. Shine Heart. Shine Heart. Oh gosh, what is the name of that clan? Oh man, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Shineheart. They're loyal to Clan Golden Plate, if I remember correctly. Oh man. Deep vein. Come on, come on. Let's get there. Um not white coin. Amber grease. Gem cutter. Gem, Cutter, Shineheart, um, Golden Point we need. Golden Point, that one is Golden Plate. Clan Golden Plate of Golden Point. Uh, Bitterhaven, I think is Clan Ambergris. Bitterhaven. Amber grease, but like grease, not ambergris, right? Um, Crag home, yep. Forget the name of that clan, but I think I can pull it up. Crag home. We'll get that one. Um, threshold. We should have if we don't. Oh, true throne, sure. Threshold. Threshold. Is a uh, clan lodestone. Uh, we have spears take. False mine. Spears take. SP. Steam slope. Snow perch. Yeah, it's spears take. Where are these numbers, too? That's from an older version of the map. Uh, Spears Take, that's Clan Stack Spear, if I remember, if I remember correctly. And then False Mine. False Mine, I don't remember that one. We can look. Crown Stone is, this is the kind of thing I could have like done before the stream, I'm now realizing, is true, or is a uh, Oath Shield. And then Mother Hold, I don't have on this map, but does exist right over here, kind of across from Nulka Terminal. Mother Hold. 
Okay. There are more, but they're not necessarily on this map because, uh, as I said, this map isn't uh, accurate. There are dwarven clans that exist at the time of the camp of my campaign, of my home game that don't exist, and vice versa at the time of the podcast. Okay. So Brewer Clan needs a name, but we can do that later. Bitter Haven and Clan Ambergris. Okay, so Clan Ambergris is they're kind of like a um uh, an alchemy clan. Oh, we got a True Throne in there too. Whoops. True Throne. Oh, Copper Keel too. Shoot. True Throne. This is again fascinating. True Throne, and then Copper Keel, Quick Lime, whatever. Okay, I gotta stop. I gotta stop fucking with this. So Bitter Haven is a small clan. They um, are all about. They're located over here. They're all about uh, alchemy. I think the idea is that they are loyal to a clan called Golden Plate, um, and Golden Plate uh, has a lot of gold, as the name would imply. And there's like a, a yeah. Here we have mixers of perfumes and elixirs. Clan Ambergris was elevated by Clan Golden Plate and was always mistrusted by the rest of the clans. A persistent rumor suggests that perhaps all of Golden Plate's gold was actually lead. All about experimentation. The clan make wine, perfume, and potions. I'm trying to think if they're still around. Um, okay. Poem of clan. Clan Ambergris. Bitter Haven. Hmm. So they're all about alchemy and perfumes. It feels similar to like a brewer clan where would, they would have a lot of like vats and stuff. I don't really know much about um, per, how perfume is made though. Um, let's just write some ideas like vats, laboratories, right? It, it would be less about like mining and metal and more about mixing. Presumably like underground gardens and things, right? Maybe like vast fungal gardens if they have like lots of herbs. Vast fungal gardens. I like the idea of like lots of booby traps that are like about poison gas or something like that, right? Like they would have a lot of like alchemists fire. What if it's like rigged to blow? That's kind of interesting, right? Yeah, that's kind of cool. Is the conceit that like maybe they didn't come back, but they filled their whole hold with like a a, a compound that can ignite, right? Yeah, that's kind of interesting. So, um, uh, Bitterhaven was abandoned during the by uh the alchemically the alchemically inclined alchemically inclined clan Ambergris was abandoned following the sorrows, following the sorrows, but on the way out, the clan left a little surprise for any trog, for any uh, intruders, any invaders into their hold, to their hold. So the question would be like, why would someone want to go there, right? Like. I like the idea of it being kind of filled with this poisonous gas. Um, the entire hold is filled or was flooded or on the way out, yeah. It's a parting gift to intruders. The entire hold was flooded with a toxic combustible the idea of like going in there accidentally sparking it and it just destroy like blows up the entire mountainside is kind of cool right again you know would the gas really sit there for 500 years who knows but that's what we're doing right combustible gas it um one spark 
is all that's needed to blow the place sky high. To empty the gas, the characters must activate a certain lever to open uh, vents on the mountainside and disperse all the trapped gas. Yeah, that's cool. I'm trying to think, like, what's something about how it's designed? Oh, yeah, we talked about, like, the vast fungal farms. Um, more like a, yeah. Bitterhaven is stratified. Bitterhaven is stratified. There's the lower levels. The lower levels are vast fungal farms where the necessary components are grown. Are grown. The middle levels are laboratories. Are laboratories where the mixes are created. The upper levels are vats. The upper levels are vats. Upper levels are full of vats and storehouses. Vats and storage where the concoctions are aged. Concoctions are aged. Yeah, that's cool. Awesome, Bitterhaven. There you go. There's a the location. See, it's possible. We can do it. Um, let's go to Copper Keep. So Copper Keep is interesting because uh, it's not on this map, but it is, it's located right here underneath the Red Thirst. So it's uh, located on an island in the underground sea in the Ezcon. Located on an island. Located on an island in the Ezcon. Uh, Copper Keep is a stronghold accessed by bridges. Um, oh yeah, I like that idea. Like some of it's under, like, so the, the, it's a, it's an underground lake, right? Um, but then under the, uh, island, they have like, you know, it goes down. And so there's like hydraulics and sealed off chambers with like windows that, that view the, the sea. That's cool. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Much of the hold is accessible or is visible, only a small portion of the hold is accessible, is visible from the surface, only a small portion of the hold is stronghold, let's say. Um, stronghold. Uh, Copper Keep is the island stronghold, is the island stronghold of Clan Copper Keel, guardians of bridges and uh, subterranean seafarers, terranean seafarers. Um, a small portion uh, of the stronghold is visible from the surface, from the island's surface. Uh, much, it instead, it instead plunges deep into the island, into the stone of the island, of the island and including many windows that gaze, gaze into the lightless sea. Imagine the things you would see down there. Ugh. Um, hydraulics are frequently used, are frequently used in the hold and copper keep uh, to raise elevators but also to seal doorways, doorways and uh, airlocks against flooding. Um, in addition, Copper Keep has an extensive, extensive dock where many copper vessels, vessels are moored. Uh, they, the clan makes a special alloy that traps air pockets, air pockets in the copper. And this allows the metallic craft to float. 
Okay, cool. Yeah. It's also been kind of flattened by troglodytes, but that's not necessarily something we have to get into huge uh, detail about. I've done crown stone already, so that's fine. We're going to pass it. Uh, let's talk about cold store. Um, cold store, if I remember correctly, is the hold of clan pure brew. And pure brew um, are all about... Um, they're a brewer clan. There's one of three. Um, are they the religious ones? No, I'm not remembering. They're devoted to clan bright shard. That I remember. Clan bright shard. Um, I'll end it up. Sorry. Um, yeah, so the, one of the three brewer clans in Coom, Clan Peer Brew, are known for their specialty ales, each key to a particular year in Coomish history. Their settlers are archives dating back thousands of years and allow dwarves to revisit their past lives. Right. Um, the hold of the hold of Clan Peer Brew. A cold store is famous for its archived brews allowing dwarves who drink who drink the concoction to recall specific dates and times it's the thing that dwarves do when they get drunk i think i, I pulled it from mordenkainen the idea that like they don't or mordenkainen's tome of foes that they don't forget they remember they like they drink to relive ancient glories or to like wallow in old sadnesses right um a small hold on the surface much of cold stores vastness comes deep below the earth where they've stored casks from every year since their founding this is treated much like an archive archive with librarians to tend uh all the vintages um i'm trying to think like obviously it would have to be some kind of a service you could do right like so it almost has like a more of a public facing thing i like that unlike other holds unlike other holds Cold store expects visitors and has a more public facing. Hey, what's up, Shad Owner? Yeah, recapture the inspiration they might have lost. That's exactly right. It's a more public facing um, attitude. I like the idea of it almost being like a wine tasting, right? Like guests can wander the upper levels and sample the various ales that um the clan has on tap so my question is what would happen during the sorrows right like would they have abandoned it would they have returned like i i like the idea that they couldn't bring it all with them right it's gonna be something because they're technically loyal to Port, uh, technically loyal to um, uh, Bright Shard, who were located there in uh, in Stone Street. And I like the notion that they would have continued to either they would have continued to brew during the five hundred years and they were gone, or they wouldn't have. Like, like I, I like the notion of the the resource historically that cold stores. Um, archive could be right but what what prevents <laughs> the sweat of one's brow what prevents the characters from just going and grabbing it right like either clan peer brew has returned or there's some kind of a protection that they've placed on the on the the seller you know i already have like a lot of okay there's knowledge behind this gate but you have to solve this riddle or whatever right so I, i'm a little hesitant to have it be a defense I almost want it to be that, like, Bright Shard is in some way, like, blackmailing them or something. Bright Shard's a little bit unscrupulous. They're, they're their elder, they are Pure Brew's elder clan, so they're kind of like, they're, you know, liege lord. And they are, but they're a little bit um, unscrupulous, greedy, and they are kind of out of 
uh, a hold right now. They're operating out of Stone Street, this kind of like Wall Street style, you know, skyscraper, if you will, in this port town. I like the idea that they like somehow intercepted Cold Store's like brews or that like they got here first before Cold Store could, so they're holding the archive hostage. I kind of think that's cool. Um, Clan Bright Shard has, ooh, because, so they're not here on this map, but out here on white spec, uh, the, um, the, uh, pfft, I can't talk. Uh, the Golden Coast Trading Company is allied with Clan Bright Shard and they're trying to like find Dwarven Mines. So I like the idea that like, uh, following the Sorrows, Sorrows, Clan Bright Shard returned to Coom before Clan Peerbrew and and was able to seize the archive the archive at the behest of Golden Coast they're attempting to use they're attempting to use this uh, base of knowledge knowledge to locate more uh, dwarven mines their parent company can exploit I like that so there's some plot there we have to you have to like go steal a cask of a particular vintage from Stone Street right because bright shards holding on to it or negotiate for it or whatever or they, you know, the party gets approached by Clan Peerbrew who wants that stuff back. It's something along those lines. That someone has, has seized it. Uh, okay, False Mine. Uh, I know there's like a clan of dwarves who, who don't mine. Like they sort of see that as being, you know, scarring the earth in some way. Uh, and I think that that's this one. Uh, oops, my phone is freaking out. Great, yeah, why not? Why not, phone? I wasn't using you for anything. I wasn't... Barely keeping this stream alive based on my ability to search my own documents on my phone. Great. But their whole thing is that, like, we, we can describe it a little bit. Like, home of clan whatever. We'll get the name in a second. Home of clan name. False mine is actually a natural cavern. It's actually an unshaped natural cavern. Cavern. You know what? There's at least one other feast fall. Yeah, I knew that there was another one over here we hadn't done yet. Well, thankfully it's next. Feast fall. I forget their clan name too, but we can we can figure it out. Okay, false mine I think is loyal to clan Lodestone. Um, the dwarves. The dwarves believing to mine minerals is to scar the earth kind of like the druid clan essentially right like these are people who don't uh they have like a beautiful natural cave where they live false mine is like way over here uh right there a beautiful natural cave that they live in and they're they're, they're kind of like the hippies right like they don't they don't really go in for the the mining there's a period in Kumish history where that kind of becomes the fashion. Um, but they were kind of like always doing it before it was cool, is the idea. So I'm scrolling for it. I would pull it up on my computer, but trying to stream and have the map and have the Google Doc all going at once, uh, it does not does not like that very much. So it'll just take me a second to find it here on my phone. But yeah, I like the idea, you know, that if it's naturally occurring that... Um, it's almost like suspiciously naturally occurring. Not that they mind it, but that it's so, you know, this this massive cave complex that like there are places in there where it, it is grand and massive and, and um, you know, wondrous. But then there are places that are tight or cramped or difficult to get into that they, they've not shaped it at all. Um, so let me see, let me see here. Other clan, Staxpear, Iron Sire. Oh, that's the name of Craig's. Yeah, Iron Sire is cool. Iron Sire. Moss Beard. Yeah. I think it was meant to be a reference to um to Moss from uh uh Junior Ventures League. Moss Beard. 
Um, a clan of druids, the, the dwarves of Mossbeard, are skilled at summoning earth elementals from the raw stone. Their hull is unworked natural stone. They disdain mining and instead practice asceticism. Yeah, great. Um, so, uh, ooh, yeah. We said this thing that, like, that's cool. So, um, once skilled at summoning earth elementals, elementals, False mine or clan moss beards hold is now in the thralls now in the thrall of a Dao. So the way that um, elementals work in on Dune is they're a little different than they are in other worlds. They don't come from other planes because my world doesn't really have other planes. Uh, elementals are formed out of like raw elements, right? So raw wind or earth or water or fire or whatever it is. Um, and they're they're kind of like um, the closest analogy I like to make is like uh, artificial intelligence, right? So you're taking something that isn't intelligent, you're giving it intelligence. They're usually created by wizards, but you know any spellcaster could conceivably do it. Um, and uh, uh, they have different like levels of intelligence. So you have like a method, right, which is kind of the like elemental, uh, like in its rawest, most kind of chaotic form. You know, they they're often uh, misbehaving and they don't want to stay in their in their shapes they want to cause trouble um and then you get like elemental elementals like become a cr5 like water elemental earth elemental and that is sort of the like elemental perfected it's like it doesn't really have a will it just sort of does what the caster wants it to do and that's sort of the ideal but then you sometimes get uh spell casters usually wizards who push that envelope and then try to give their elemental sentience and that's how you get a djinn Right, so like, a, or a genie. That's, so that's how you get a djinn is a, a air elemental that's been given sentience. Uh, you know, uh, an afrit is a fire elemental, so on and so forth. So a dao is an earth elemental given sentience. Um, the and it, they're that's why they're kind of like obsessed with this notion of like, you know, ownership and slaves and and identity. Right, like genies are always kind of bound up in the notion of. Um, master right and so i wanted to honor that while not necessarily having to be like hey they keep slaves or they're former slaves it's this idea of like the robot that achieves sentience right and it looks at the way that that other elementals are treated essentially um is now in the thrall of a dao uh any clan who returned here is now enslaved by them um a massive entirely naturally made entirely naturally formed uh false mine is at places breathtakingly beautiful and at others claustrophobically claustrophobically cramped um yeah i think that's fine and then like one more thing like moss you know that they like grew stuff they have like farms of moss yeah something like that's kind of cool there are moss grows in abundance moss grows in abundance here fed by a tributary of uh the kudranone kudranone there's always the sound of trickling water false mind water in false mine uh so you have feast fall way over here i don't know tons about this uh it's located in the gorge lands so this is like a little area where um where the, basically at the mouth of the kudranone the mother's milk like comes out of this uh mountain called the nursemaid and then it sort of pours its way down through these uh very tight cramped like canyons and gorges um i know that feast fall is the hold of a clan um who were once uh or i don't know if they, they once were but they're they're the other one of the other brewer clans not rot gut not pure brew but they're the like um they're kind of like a religious order so they do it uh in devotion to kavish the uh the goddess of of drink and death um do i have them on here i don't i don't have them so we might have to skip that one for now I don't have any uh, information about them. We might pass over Feastfall, but they are on there. 
A uh, golden point we can do. That's a pretty easy one. Um, let me see what I have listed for uh, golden plate. This is their uh, seat. They're an elder clan. And you, as you can kind of tell here on the map, the idea was that they have basically coated the entire peak in gold. Um, so it's like extremely opulent. They're kind of all about that, right? Um, let me see what I have for their description of their seat. Um, a golden mountain peak. Here. The seat of... You know, again, I could probably do this one on my own because I've already got it written. I can just transfer that over. That's fine. Um, yeah, I'll do that later. Uh, let's do Glass Garden. So Glass Garden, the idea with this one, it's w located way over here. Um, kind of here between the three shields, like Strong Arch, and then Glass Garden's kind of in the, like, it's in the exact middle now. Um, it is essentially a hold inside of a geode. Um, a massive, massive geode. Um, and the, uh, the people there are kind of gem cutters, yes, but they're mainly, like, crystals is kind of their thing. So let me pull them up and see what we know about Clan, uh, Glass Grower. Gold draws attention from all. Yeah, exactly. The idea, too, with it is that, um, gold is seen as a kind of cheap metal because it's so soft. The dwarves wouldn't value it, so Clan Golden Plate is kind of a, um, they're sort of like the lowest tier of the Elder Clans. And so th there's a lot of kind of that, like, Trumpian, like, I'm gonna coat everything in gold because gold is what, like, a poor person thinks a rich person values, you know? I like the idea that that scene is being very showy and kind of, like, uh, tawdry by the rest of the dwarves. Um, but yeah, of course, if there's this place covered in gold, it's gonna draw a lot of attention. Um... Great. Uh, did I just scroll past it? Come on. Come back here. Oh my god, I did. That's so, that's so fucking annoying. Come back here. Um, here we go. Uh, dwelling inside an enormous geode, Clan Glass Grower, grows quartz crystals. They are known for their fabulous lenses used in spectacles, jeweler's lobes, telescopes, goggles, helmets, and even divination. They regard the crystals as living things akin to plants and treat them with the utmost respect. Okay, great. Um, Glass Garden is remarkable not merely as the seat of the artistic clan glass grower, but because it is located inside a gargantuan geode. Um, let's see. Unlike other Dwarven clans, other Dwarven clans, clan glass grower. Hey, what's going on, Matthew? Thanks for coming. We're working on uh, this Dwarven kingdom. We're trying to fill out some of these locations that I have some information for, but not, not everything. Thanks for coming. We're going to be streaming for about another half an hour before we wrap it up. Um, employees great deal a great deal of light a great deal of light in their hold to better display the incredible forests of crystals and um crystals and quartz they grow um Trying to see, like, I like the idea that there's like a three dimension, three dimensionality to it, right? Because if it's a geode, then you would get those like crystals and things kind of growing from all sides. And again, I don't know exactly how a real geode works, guys. This is a fantasy game. Leave me alone. But you know what I mean? That there's like some element to it where there's like stuff on the ceiling and, and, um, I mean, they could just live on the bottom and then like the, the stuff grows, but like they would, they would, you know, suspend themselves up. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, the crystal miners suspend themselves themselves from the ceiling to grant access ooh fortune tellers that's cool yeah it's like good for scrying and stuff too right grant access to the crystals that grow that grow from the ceiling of the cavern from the ceiling of the cavern the hole itself is constructed on the floor floor um something about like uh 
dwarves from this clan, from this clan, insist on the different species, insist on the different species of crystal, of crystal, and clump them together like one would with vegetables, right? So there's like a blue section, yeah, like a blue quarter, a blue quarter, a red quarter, right? Like, and they give them kind of specific names as other different varieties. You know, there's there's this there's definitely this like perhaps erroneous uh, way of thinking that these crystals are um, you know uh, living things. I think that's cool. I love that. Uh, cool. That's glass. Uh, that's glass garden. I dig that. A uh, crag home is interesting. So crag home is located over here. It's a uh, a dwarven hold, like all of these ones we've been working on uh, for the past hour or so. And the idea is that it is essentially the, like, I needed a place where golems kind of originally came from. So we have a clan called uh, I Clan Iron Wonder. Uh, they're located over here. Um, and they're kind of the, the original artificer clan, right? The original people who were like, hey, we're going to make mechanical, you know, contraptions and things like that. There's lots of different, like, um, uh, offshoots. You know, there's like a crossbow clan and there's a trap clan. There's the alchemist clan. Um, there's the elemental clan, but that's not quite artifice. That's a little bit more natural. So I wanted a clan that who, whose whole thing was golems. Um, and so, uh, I came up with this one called Iron Sire. And the idea is that it is based on a, the kind of like conceit behind the clan is that it's like a, uh, almost a cult of personality behind sort of like rogue artificer who left clan Iron Wonder to, to found their own clan. Um, very much based on an Iron Man, Tony Stark kind of a vibe. Of course, even Iron is there in the name. Um, but they were this genius who invented the idea of, you know, iron golems and clay golems and things like that. Um, and they went out to go found their own clan called Iron uh, Sire. And it's, you know, very commercially successful, almost kind of outshining the clan that they swore loyalty to, and that's uh, uh, Lodestone. So let me pull up what I have about Iron Sire. That's probably everything, but I just want to make sure there aren't any details that I'm missing. They are loyal to Lodestone. If I can dig them up here. Yeah, this is turning to be a little bit more useful. There was like a 20-minute period in the middle of the stream where I was like, is this stupid? Should we not be doing this? Um, founded by a maverick artificer who left Clan Iron Wonder, Clan Ironside is, a, is the primary producer of clay, stone, and iron golems and coom. Cult of personality to their founder. Uh, they are rich, but politically influential and would overshadow a more concerned elder clan. Did they make the Gulliabari? Yeah, they definitely did. So Craig, Craig Iron Wonder is the, the leader. That's why it's called Craig Home, right? Um, and you'd be something like quick and simple that you can make it like, it's this, there's this vanity to it. So definitely one of the things is that like, there's an enormous statue. There's an enormous statue to Craig in the middle of the hold, possibly the like, possibly it's the like central support that makes the hold possible. That like without that thing, right? There, there, there's some central support that makes this, uh, this place possible. And without that, then the whole thing would come crumbling down. I'm thinking more like tech bro. Like I like the idea of like a, um, of a like uh, almost a Google campus kind of a vibe. Um, there are puzzles and um, uh, you know, it has kind of a like sandals in the office sort of an element to it, right? Uh, Shadowrunner says, uh, Golem, the statue that walks. Some use uh, some use an elemental spirit bound to animate, others inscribe runic magics into the parts and power by magical horse. I think it's the latter. I think it's some kind of a runic magic, you know, if you want to use the, the Eberron example of the Gulra, right, the symbol on the forehead. Um, the, there are puzzles and um, minor activities placed in the common areas of the hold, a means to test the metal of the clan's artificers who were essentially a preferred class of citizens to the laborers, right? That There's like a, again, a Silicon Valley kind of an element to it, right? Where they, the, the artificers are more valued than someone who just mines, right? Um, that's a clan that like, like values genius or whatever. 
more than labor. I want to know what's going on here in the uh, in the sorrows, right? So it's tricky because you, you want to make sure that each clan has a slightly different story as it pertains to the sorrows, right? Some of them never come back. Some of them do. Uh, some of them have stayed behind uh, the entire time. But uh, you want to make sure each one is distinct. So Craig is definitely not around, and he's probably not even around. Yeah, the Grand Ancient Statue is like Atlas. I like that, that it's like all about him holding it up. I was kind of imagining like this, right, where it's like more subtle. Uh, but if you look at it, it's like, well, actually, if you if you remove this statue of him, then the whole thing comes down. So it's like all to Craig's vanity. Um, but... Yeah, you have to figure out like like what is their story as it pertains to the um as it pertains to the uh the sorrows. So Craig would have formed this thing, like if it's called Craig Home now, maybe he's contemporary to my current campaign, which is set about fifteen hundred years before, but he wouldn't be still alive, obviously, now. So either they have like we can't say that they've stayed because only a few clans have stayed and I don't want to make that a bigger thing. Either they left um, and they never came back or they left and they returned. Let's have them return because I think that's a little bit more interesting. Like the notion of like golems, you know, guarding it or like... Because we, we have False Mine, which has the Tao, right? So the elementals that kind of like took over. There's something sort of interesting about like... Um, Crag home like like uh, iron sire didn't return but the golems still act like dwarves right that there are like yeah i mean like what if point of it is that like it's heavily automated Ooh, there are no workers right everything is done by artifact by golems there are no lower level workers in the clan everything is done by automation Golems mine, golems cook, golems, golems run the place. When Iron Sire fled during the sorrows, the golems continued and haven't stopped since. So instead you get this like weird animatronic thing, right? Where you go into the place and these golems are still going through all the motions even though no one is around. And if you like interrupt them, then it causes them to like malfunction and attack you, right? You have to kind of let them do their little thing. The idea of like a, a, a golem cook who's using no like uh, ingredients, you know? Um, constructed or founded by a founded by a wayward artificer uh, uh wayward iron wonder artificer iron wonder artificer crag home crag home was the was the center of the iron sire empire of the iron sire uh golem making empire a clan more influential than either of their parent clans that's awesome um you return to having troubles with invaders vandalism and getting things back on track yeah then that's that's a story that's like all across coom right tons of these clans have come back and had to deal with things and that's the trick is that you got to find like new spins on that stuff right uh motherhold i know about so let's skip that one let's talk about ruby reach ruby reach is way over here um it's kind of on the the easternmost Point, just a little bit south of Steam Slope. And the idea with Clan Brine Miner is that they uh, they mine, they're like salt miners. So you have the salt pan here, the Red Thirst, right? These kind of salt flats. And again, this isn't really how salt works, of course, or salt mining. But the notion is that like they dig underneath the salt pan in between the surface and the, the, uh, the lake. There's like a, a salty subterranean sea. And so in between those two, there's this little stretch of salt uh, crystals that they go down and they mine and bring back out. Um, I think they are kind of considered to be like like kind of hicks, right? They're not really, uh, uh, hell, that's not really real mining, you know, because they're not really mining stone or precious metal. It's salt. Um, so the home of clan brine miner 
Yeah, Aaron Golem. And yeah, you could definitely have like a... Ooh, that's cool. Shatner says an Aaron Golem developed a will of its own. You can definitely have a Golem that's like shaped after Crag, right? And believes itself to be Crag. One Golem believes itself to be Crag. Shaped in his image. I mean, if you really wanted to go crazy with it, you could do a thing where like successive golems like he has transferred his consciousness to these golems you know what i mean like if you really want to go nuts that's kind of fun um ruby reach the clan of uh, the home of clan brine miner ruby reach gets its name from the uh crimson salt crystals which like i don't think this is a real thing but i've seen it in a bunch of sci-fi like the, the the salt is red on um on uh crate in the last jedi and then the game um deep rock galactic uses red salt as well is this like a thing like i tried googling it and i couldn't find anything but like i'm taking it because it's much more evocative than just white because everything is white here right so apparently salt in fantasy sci-fi is red and i'm okay with that um from the crimson salt crystals that they use liberally in their in their decoration decoration um yeah i like the idea of like they mine the salt under the red thirst but then they use it in their decoration too so like they're constantly calling it like ruby reach and it's ruby this and ruby that but like you know that's not actually rubies um many of the locations in the stronghold are named after various types of rubies or are named after rubies the Ruby Hall, the Ruby Gates, the Ruby Hall, etc. Despite not actually <laughs> containing rubies. I think that's cool. Um, they're a little far from the mines, right? Like if they're over here, like they're close to the Red Thirst, but if they're going to go mining underneath it. So like it could be a thing about... Um, how they like uh uh there are tunnels that head there but like there's tunnels to the mines is like true of all of them um well what about the sorrows did they come back i feel like fine forge didn't steam slope i think did wonderworks i think did so ruby reach either could or couldn't i'm trying to figure out what the right like i feel like they would that makes sense to me Maybe they would try to like horn in on somebody else's turf if they are not pleased with being like uh, ruby miners. Hmm. I need one more thing about the hold too, like something interesting about it. Um. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um. Did they come back? Red salts have a higher iron con. So red salt is a thing. Is that true? Or am I crazy? Because I tried looking and I couldn't find anything about it. That was, you know, months ago, if not years ago, um, when I was developing it. Brine Miner. They, hmm. Because it feels like their services would still be pretty useful, right? Like, despite them kind of being seen as sort of like a, uh, you know, a, a like unpopular, like sort of lower tier clan. Salt seems like it would be very valuable. Um... Maybe you make a point about, like, um, Ruby Reach is also, is often home, often home to other, um, to non-dwarves, to non-dwarves, like, like non-dwarves are a common site in Ruby Reach, like, they, they would be selling salt kind of on the, on the sly, yeah, non-dwarves, oh, that's it. There's a fertile smuggling trade out of Ruby Reach. Selling salt to passing ships, no matter what the Dwarven, what True Throne says about trading, says about trading. Tunnels beneath the keep lead to the sea and a secret anchorage where sm salt smugglers drop anchor 
Yeah. So, like, there there are all kinds of hidden passages and stuff because they would smuggle salt out to ships that would be passing along that way. There, At various times in Coombe's history, there are different embargoes and things against trading. So I like the idea that Ruby Reach is one of those places that does that, right? They, they particularly um, circumvent that. So I like the notion, then, of in some way that is reflected in them returning. So did they, like... I don't want to have like someone else be there. Maybe there's a smuggler space there, but we we have a location that's not on this map, but like kind of north of the unwanted land, there's a there's a, a location here that's called a uh, shamble, I think. Um and it's a uh little smuggler's den. So what's going on in Ruby Reach now? Are they back or are they not back? There are like troglodytes would have spilled over the over the sea. So like it would make sense to me that they wouldn't be there anymore. Ooh, what if, like, salt is useful against troglodytes or against yog stuff? That's kind of interesting. Because it, it tends to have, like, a, a warding effect against evil. So, like, the clan Brian Miner, Brian Miner fled during the Sorrows sorrows unaware that the salt of their home would have repelled yogg's servants that like that is actually a pretty nice little stronghold there so they're not there anymore but the salt could be used in ritual and stuff against um against yogg's servants that's cool okay it's uh 745 i say let's do one more let's do shineheart and then we can move on. I have one idea for Shineheart. They are located all the way across the kingdom over here, kind of next to the nursemaid there. Um, and they are, uh, they were once loyal to a clan called Glimmer Gem. They're currently loyal to a clan called Golden Plate. And um, let's see, let's see. The idea is, is that clan Golden Plate is like an up-jumped minor clan. So they were, or an under clan, I believe is the term. They were beneath uh, an elder clan uh, called Glimmer Gem, and then Glimmer Gem was basically eradicated in a civil war. And um, the crown elevated basically like a betrayer clan, the clan who turned against Glimmer Gem, and but basically put them in their place, right? So now uh, Glimmer Gem, or sorry, uh, Golden Plate, who are located here in Golden Point, are in charge of a bunch of other clans they used to be peers with. And so the notion behind uh, clan, uh, the notion behind gem cutter is that they were, they believe themselves to be a better and more superior clan than um, uh, Golden Plate. So it's just kind of like ancient animosity. Um, because Glimmer Gem used to work with this substance called Lusterine, uh, gem cutters were kind of partnered with them in that way. So it says, once the favorite vassals of clan Glimmer Gem, clan gem cutter has long resented the rise of clan golden plate their grudge is ancient and stretches nearly back to the founding of the kingdom they've returned to coom but have made no contact with the golden plate and do not support their status as an elder clan so that's kind of cool that already tells us what we need to know about them i think it's called shineheart because i liked the idea that deep in the center deep in the center of the hold of the stronghold is a massive emerald is a massive emerald um the clan clan gem cutter literally cuts pieces away from this emerald and thanks to ignone's blessing it grows back it slowly grows back um salt uh, sorry salt owner shadow owner says salt a symbol of purity is often used protection against evil yeah exa that's exactly what i'm thinking shadow owner is that salt could could be along with like sacristeel and a couple of other things could be used uh, to ward off um, Yog. I think that's neat. Um, it explains why Yog doesn't have a lot of like sea creatures, right? It doesn't like the ocean. Uh, deep in the center of the stronghold is a massive emerald clan gem cutter. So he cuts back pieces away. Yeah. So the uh... oh shoot, well, I opened up a thing I didn't want to open up. The home of clan gem cutter, Shineheart is um it's famous for its gemstones specifically emeralds 
specifically emeralds and the way the intricate way they fashion them and the intricate way they fashion them um let me see let me see so yeah they've returned clan yeah you remember lusterine right chat hunter clan gl uh gem cutter has returned following the sorrows but they do not acknowledge uh golden point or golden plate as their as their elder clan they're doing their own thing and can't be bothered and resent them yeah resent them something else architectural about their hold I'm trying to think like ooh yeah there's a secret deposit of lusterine in shineheart for years they've mined the rare mineral despite clan golden plate technically holding like rights to it so there are seven like unique minerals that are found in coom um lusterine is one of them uh and it like uh it has this uh, kind of bewitching effect that if you stare at raw lusterine it sort of entrances you and then you uh you just stare at it until someone shakes you out of it there's wing rock which we talked about that like levitates stone um there's uh illuminite which is uh like uh, basically like solar powered crystals right they they take um um sunlight and they can reflect it uh there is uh ferrofluid which is i think a real thing actually but it's like liquid iron essentially that through uh, when given like a resonant frequency can be shaped into different things um there's sacrosteel which we've talked about is basically like the kind of radiant metal that holds the uh, the earth in place uh there's mithril uh, obviously which is like a, a very very hard very very light metal famously invented by tolkien and then there's lodestone which is a magnetic uh, mineral that if you put some charge into can uh, like attracts to itself each one of the the elder clans is is an elder clan because they sit on a on the the world's only deposit of this rare mineral um and then uh, uh that's kind of where their power comes from is their ability to create these things um and so when golden play when glitter gem was defeated um exclusive rights to mine lusterine would have gone to golden plate but because Shineheart was sort of their partner back in the day, Gem, Glitter Gem's partner, they, you know, still have a, a stake in it, essentially. Uh, great. Okay, I think we're going to stop there. There's a few more to do, and there's obviously a, a lot more locations on my map of Coombe. Um, But that's probably where we're going to call it for today, because I am starving and I have not eaten my dinner. Um, oh, Shadowrunner says, Now picturing an epic quest to assemble those few materials from disparate parts of the Empire to a craftsman to craft a set of items to combat Yogg's forces. Yeah, that's awesome. Like salt, sacristy, there's got to be like a couple of others, you know, just like radiant damage in general. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for coming, everybody. It was a little bit of a quieter stream today, but that's okay. Uh, we're getting back to it after like almost a month absent. Um, we will, will not be back next week for world building. It'll be the week after that because I have a game that would normally be during our streaming time on Sunday. Um, it, I might end up moving it, but at this point I'm pretty booked in terms of streams, what with Tuesday, Thursday, uh, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, but thank you so much for coming and watching. Uh, if you like my content, or you like this video, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Go ahead and click that like button too. That would be a huge help um, just to get a few more eyes on the video. Obviously, you know, we're a pretty small channel. You know, we don't get that many views, but every little bit helps. Um, you can find me on Twitter at ProDMTimothy. We have a Patreon, we have a Discord, um, all of that stuff. I would normally point you towards uh, my website, but I'm, I'm fully booked right now. I do not have any, any time to take on new clients. But if you did like this video, there's a huge playlist full of other videos all about Coom and its history and kind of how to create a campaign setting from the bottom up. Um, I can't guarantee that it's the most concise way uh, to... Uh, uh, it's the most concise way to uh, to build a campaign setting, especially, you know, if you don't have two years. But it is kind of the, like, uh, outside-in approach rather than the inside-out. Uh, great. So thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks to Shadowner and uh, Matthew and to David for all being here. 
Chat owner says, maybe that crazy Craig embodied golem. Ooh, yeah, that is cool. Um, that was, yeah, I, I think we had some really cool stuff. I liked the golems. I liked um, David's idea about the um, adamant anvil that we talked about. The soul to Revelation was kind of cool. That's like a new thing I, I just thought up about, for, thought of for Yogg. So that's very, very interesting. Uh, cool. So I will talk to you guys. I think we'll next be back on Tuesday for an adventure prep stream, 2 p.m., and we're going to be looking at another chapter of Wild Beyond the Witchlight. We're going to be talking about Downfall, the like sort of bog town with all the bullywugs in um, in Hither, the first location of Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Uh, great. So again, thank you so much for coming. Um, I always do this where I forget what the good what goodbye is in Dwarven. I think it's Kevazad, uh, Kevazad Odvari, and I will see you all next time. Thanks for coming. Oops, wrong one. Let's go to outro. Here we go. Mm-hmm.